There's one image in this story that's always bothered me. When Jesus and the others come to the house, Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever, presumably very ill. Jesus heals her, and what does she do immediately? She gets up and she starts serving them. Some translations even have her waiting tables. It always seemed to me kind of sexist or maybe even misogynist that this poor woman would be expected or obligated to get back to work right after being so sick. But there's a detail that's missing in your English translation of the Bible. In Greek, like in English, there are several different words that can mean to serve. One of them comes from the same root as the Greek word for servant or slave, which would make sense, right? <clears throat> that word means the kind of menial labor that I imagine when I hear this story. Waiting tables, tidying up the house, dusting. And that's what upsets me when I hear this, that this, this woman would feel this need to pour herself into this work for her male guests when only moments before she'd been laid flat with a fever. But that's not the verb that this story uses. It uses a different word, the word diakoneo, which is the English, excuse me, the, the root of our English word deacon. It means to serve, yeah, but it can also mean to minister. Instead of menial labor, it has the connotation of sharing or participating in work. The labor itself could be menial, but the spirit in which it's done is not, an obligate, is not a spirit of obligation or humiliation but out of solidarity. When the apostles in the book of Acts were overwhelmed with the task of not only preaching the gospel, but then also distributing bread to the widows, they appointed seven deacons to help with the work, to help with the serving, the diaconel. <clears throat> it wasn't that the work of distributing bread to the widows was beneath them, far from it. It was that that work was too much for them. They needed help. These, dirt, these deacons served alongside the apostles, doing a job that was just as important, but which needed more hands and a different set of skills. Several of those deacons, by the way, went on to do grand things like Philip, who baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, or Stephen, who preached the gospel even as he, as he was being stoned to death. Simon's mother-in-law wasn't waiting tables. She's serving alongside Jesus and his disciples. Jesus finds her prostrate in the throes of a fever, and he heals her by lifting her up, by raising her to a place of power and health where she has agency and authority. And then she serves them like they just served her. It's an act of mutual and equitable compassion. And I can't help but wonder if this peculiar and prominent detail about Simon's mother-in-law is intended by Mark as a story about what Jesus does for us. Jesus finds us bent low and weighed down, laid flat and sickened by the effects of sin on our world. And he raises us up so that we can join him and continue his work of proclaiming the message of God's kingdom and casting out the demons that afflict us. I notice the progression of this story. First, Jesus casts out one demon in the synagogue and heals one woman in the house. Then the whole town congregates outside the door where he casts out many demons and heals many diseases. And from there he goes to all the towns, casting out demons and healing the sick. That's a lot of work for one person. He needs some help, some deacons. It's this work, this service or ministry that he has been called to do and in which we also have been invited to participate. Now, in these past few weeks, we've been talking about call, about vocation and how, to, how we discern it, how to determine where God is calling us next. This story invites us to ask ourselves how God is inviting us to serve as we have been served, how to respond to the healing touch of Jesus who brings us the good news of abundant life. How are we as the church to respond? What role can we play in the healing of our nation, of our culture, 
of our world? Well, friends, that's exactly the question we're going to dig into today. Following this worship service, we're going to have a conversation in which we seek to deepen our understanding about how the church can best serve a society that is, so, that is already so divided and becoming more so every day. The question is, do we best serve our neighbors by being a community where we can all leave our differences at the door and come together over common ground? Perhaps it's best for the church to steer clear of politics and potentially divisive issues entirely so that we can be a nursery for community. Maybe the best way we can create healing is to be a neutral ground, a sanctuary or a refuge. Perhaps then those relationships that we begin to build here can be the ties that bind us together in the public sphere, the nuclei of healing in our fractured world. Of course, how deep can those relationships be if we're not bringing our whole selves to them? If we're avoiding controversy and division, are we really contributing to the health and the health of our communities? Maybe it would be better for the church to be a safe place to exchange and discuss those ideas, a place where we can openly state our opinions without fear of judgment, where we can listen to opposing arguments without feeling the need to defend or correct. Could that be the best way we can serve? Can the church be the big tent where all perspectives and opinions are welcomes and welcomed and respected? If the church takes on that role of being a mediator and a bridge builder, though, where do we draw the line? What happens when we encounter perspectives that are incompatible with God's kingdom? White nationalism cannot exist alongside racial equity. Bigotry can't hold hands with compassion. Maybe God's call to the church is to reclaim its place as the conscience of society, the voice proclaiming loudly and consistently the holiness and morality of God. Perhaps the best way we can serve is to take an unyielding position on what is right and wrong. But then how do we determine that? How can we be sure that we're speaking for God and not just for ourselves? Although there are many ways for the church to respond to this question of bringing healing to division, these three perspectives are the ones we're going to be looking at particularly today. There may be room in the larger church for all three of these perspectives, but unlike St. Paul, we as individuals and congregations are not generally able to be all things to all people, are we? But that's the strength of the church together. Although we can only be who we are individually, together the church can be all things to all people because the church has room for all people. And that's God's gift to us, that God calls each of us as we are into this community to be who we are, who God has created us to be. And together we fit into this larger cosmopolitan community of believers. What this means for us is that our task is to figure out who God has created us to be. Are we a community of refuge? A community of mediation? A community of, with a prophetic voice? How has God called and equipped this congregation and the people in it to address this issue? That's the question we're going to explore today. We're not going to find the answer in a single hour. But I hope and I expect that we will be able to do some good processing and thinking about how we might continue to seek that answer faithfully and with God's help. I can tell you that no matter what, we are not called to be a community lying down. Like Simon's mother-in-law, Jesus shows up in this story, walking into our houses and taking us by the hand to raise us to new health and new life. With this gift of wholeness, we too are invited to serve as we have been served, to love as we have been loved. Our life and our ministry, our diakonia, together in this community, is one way that we can do that. But it's not the only way. Even as we join together in this conversation about who our community can be together, 
we're also invited to consider and to contemplate who God is calling and equipping each of us to be in our own lives, our own families, our own contexts. Are you that person who is always safe? Are you a mediator who brings different people together? Or a prophet who proclaims the way? How is God calling you to respond to the other issues and the perils of this world? Things like racism and climate change or birth control and gun control? What does it mean for you as a person of faith to be navigating these issues? What's your role in this? It's my hope that by practicing this process together, we might all be better equipped to take on this task in our own lives. And so I hope you'll stick around after this today and join us. Because I wonder if this discuss discussion today can be one way, perhaps one way among many, that Jesus is reaching out to take each of us by the hand, to raise us up to that work, to that service of our own ministry.